Well, why not start early? You're all here on this beautiful autumn day. Welcome to you all. And anybody who's watching on online, I hope it's a beautiful autumn day where you are too. And happy Mother's Day to people who are mothers, stepmothers, you know, all those things. And of course, afterwards, we do have tea and coffee and conversation in the hall, but you all know that. So I hope to see you all there. And our acknowledgement of country. As we look upon the hills and valleys, we see the love poured out on this land by those who've cared for this land since time beyond measure. We honour those who've gone before and those who are yet to come. May we be mindful of the calling God places on humanity to care for creation. May we take the lead from the Ghana people whose stories are entwined with the stewarding of this place. May we learn from them and walk with them in God's covenant. It was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were.
Join with me in our call to worship. We will never completely know the fullness of God, the divine one who lives in mystery around us and within us. Yet we are drawn to God's presence. Today we come in the fullness of who we are, seeking the one who lives in mystery. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come this day seeking your presence in our hearts and minds with our whole selves. Teach us how to live. Remind us who we are. In Jesus' name, amen. It starts really early. I think our, our forgetting starts really early. And one of the things that we sometimes forget is the power of words. The word Messiah is one of those words. I don't think we really fully understand what it means anymore. We've forgotten just what it meant to the people who lived in Jesus' time. We sort of think of it as a, a title or, you know, when we translate it to Greek and we say Christ, those two words are the same word, we almost think it's Jesus' last name, Jesus Christ. But I don't think we really fully understand what it means, what the significance of looking for the Messiah really meant to Jesus' followers. The only way to sort of start to unpack what it means and where it comes from is to go back to the beginning, to the beginning, beginning. You know, all of us, when we were born, or before we were born, we were connected. You know, you can imagine and think about through the umbilical cord and then even after birth, we don't see ourselves as separate from our mother. It takes a long time for that to happen, and developmental psychologists have looked at, at when and how, and it takes many, many months before you begin to realize that you are separate from your mother. And it's like that with the world, too. You don't know that about yourself as being somehow separate from everything else that exists. You're a part of everything, and everything's a part of you. That's, that sense of connection and being a part of all things and being at one with all things is probably part of why, throughout all time, humans have been sought after the divine, sought after the creator, because we have this sense of being disconnected and we're yearning for reconnection. That's what those two stories at the beginning of the book of Genesis are all about. They're about the disconnection and the, the movement towards being reconnected to the divine, reconnected to the source of all creation, reconnected to the fullness of who we are and our place in the world. It's out of that story of reconnection that we then get all of the other stories in our, in our tradition that build on top, whether it's the stories of the matriarchs and patriarchs who taught us that beginning part about relationship and from where we get things like the Ten Commandments and what will it mean to be a community and how will we live together, how will we understand ways to, to move back towards connection through to the prophets and the priests who would constantly guide people back, say, don't forget, you should be connected. You are part of God's life. God is part of your life. Come back to this way constantly doing that. And it was out of all of that that this Messiah and the, the 
message that God would enter into the world in a new way, a way that would really fully connect people to God's story. That's what the Messiah was all about. It's about, it's about reconnecting to God's story and being one with who we are and how we fit. And then Jesus comes. And Jesus fits part of the story because, you know, as, as people knew that God would come and connect and the Messiah would be with them, they built up all sorts of different hopes and dreams and put them on what uh, God was doing in the world. And they brought their own ideas. They thought Messiah would be about kingship and about the liberation of their country and about all sorts of things that it turns out Jesus didn't quite fit. Jesus kept him to this bigger vision that was beyond just something about them, but about all things. It took them a while to really get on board with that. We have all these stories of, of, of people, the disciples like Peter and James and John, and as they meet Jesus, they can see something in him, something in his personhood, something about what he's doing and saying, and they think, there's something about this that moves me, heart and mind and body, something that captures them. They, don't, they still don't really fully understand. I love in the Gospel of Mark, as Mark tells the story, there's the scandal of the Messiah. You know, the whole time, they never really sort of get it. They're always sort of lost, but they're still seeking. They're trying to understand who is Jesus, what's he about, what could it mean for him to be the Messiah, to, have, to be the one who will connect us to God, but maybe not in the way we imagined. What could that look like? And they go and they follow and they, they have moments of great clarity and then they have moments where they just don't get it. And then we come to Easter. And Jesus, from the cross, cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's an interesting moment in our story. It's a moment when the Messiah connects deeply with the doubt, with the brokenness, with the, the lack of clarity around who he is and who these people are, and how God is loving all of them through this most horrific time. I often wonder if Jesus is equally calling out to those disciples those ones who will walk away, go into hiding. Those ones who will, out of fear, lock themselves in rooms. Why don't they get it? Why don't they understand what he's there to do and the love that he offers them, the love that he offers all of us. That sense of being abandoned. Abandoned by God, abandoned by this dream, God's kingdom in the world that would be about love, that would be about justice, that would be about equality, that was there right from the beginning in this story that started in Genesis and went right through there was a sense of what happened to that.
And afterwards, the disciples went. Some of them went into hiding. Some of them went to go back to their old lives. What what to do now? They felt lost. The Messiah whom they'd waited for, who they'd finally decided, okay, maybe it's not the way we thought it was, but we know when we meet Jesus, this is the one. Now he's gone. What do we do? Come willing to explore and seek a living faith. In this new space, we long to gain a faith that touches joy and pain. We come with questions deep. We come with answers few. some light to shine upon our quest. We take the risk of losing faith, yet we can walk no other path. We gently put aside concepts and creeds of Seek some ancient wisdom that our hearts may hold. From seeds of doubt, new life may flow, if given care and space. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In some small way, it's reassuring to hear John speak of the doubt, the loneliness, and sense of abandonment felt not only by Jesus' disciples in the face of the arrest and the state-sanctioned murder of their leader, but also the sense of abandonment felt by Jesus himself on the cross. There would be few, if any, amongst us who has not experienced any of the following. A sense of doubt and faltering faith, a sense of loneliness and abandonment, dismay and anguish at the destruction of the natural environment through climate change, war and greed.
The poem, When All Seems Lost, by Geraldine Morgan, resonates with the sadness and tragedy suffered by so many people in our lives and in the lives of people across the world. Let me share the poem with you. A man who loved me surely died. Depression fell so heavily. Oh, how my soul did groan and wail. Ila ila lama sabachthani. I saw the passion of the Christ those darkest days in history, and as he died, he gasped for words, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That holy Thursday felt like hell. I felt such doom and agony. There in the depths I swore I heard, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. I came to grips with my own sin. An angel tore the veil from me. An echo in my mind did form, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. The world I saw was clothed in lies and drenched in pain and poverty. From all directions came the cries, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. A drunken man fell in the street, was jeered and held in mockery. His eyes reflected back to all, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. A poor man stood near thoroughfare who with his dog gazed hungrily and scrawled upon their sign was this, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. What should we do when all seems lost, when hounded by the enemy? Remember those last words he cried, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani.
Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and God will give you another advocate to be with you forever. I will not leave you orphaned. One of my favorite singer-songwriters, and that of a close friend of mine who has suffered great tragedy in her life, is Nick Cave. This friend and I were fortunate to attend his concert last year. The music and the lyrics were a great great gift from a contemporary Australian bard. But an even more enduring gift is his weekly blog that some of you might know of called The Red Hand Files. If you haven't come across them, I do recommend them to you, the Red Hand Files. These are letters through which each week he answers questions from fans and people on the same quest for faith and belief. When asked by one person how she could find faith again in life and love, he wrote, Faith is not something that just magically materialises. Rather, it calls first to us with its demands, and sometimes these demands are significant. Faith in the universe, for example, requires our active participation. The world awakens to us as we set about the task of its rehabilitation. Faith is not passive, but fiercely active. So we need to invest something of ourselves in the world in order to appreciate its value. The more we put into the world, the more value it appears to have. So it is with God. To have faith in God, if this is what you want, requires an active involvement in the mechanics of belief. We set out on a journey, and that journey can be long and very hard, for the light is often buried deep, emerging from the darkness. We labour to improve our relationship with God, whoever or whatever that may be. Nick Cave continues to suffer from the personal tragedy of, his, of the death of his 15-year-old son. My close friend, who is also the fan of Nick Cave, lost her son and her husband in a house fire over two decades ago. Both of them battle in their enduring grief to maintain faith and a belief in God. For a person in the midst of grief, to simply stand and not fall headlong may be all the person can do. It may be the arm around that person by another that assists the process of healing. In the midst of grief and pain, we feel no hope. Faith itself is a gift and it is a mystery. Somehow, in our engagement with the pain of the world, the pain experienced by many Indigenous people, refugees, those experiencing homelessness or poverty, and those suffering from domestic violence, God is revealed and somehow gives our own soul meaning and hope. It is this engagement in the pain around and within that somehow opens us to the love of God and hope within the world. In our own times of doubt and in this period leading to the Pentecost, it is important to remember Jesus' promise to the disciples at the Last Supper of the coming of the Holy Spirit reported in John 14, 15 to 17. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot receive him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, 
for he abides with you and will be in you. It is this promise of the Holy Spirit as the comforter, counsellor, helper and advocate that supported the disciples' continued belief in the words and actions of Jesus. Just as today, amongst us, we have many examples of people who are inspired by a faith in God, the teachings of Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit to follow in the footsteps of Jesus to build relationships. Relationships within our own circle of family and friends, but as importantly, to build relationships for those most in need, the most marginalised. And we have four people who will speak about this area. Another one of the things I like about Pilgrim, um, something else they do a bit differently to what I've seen in other churches, is when we give thanks for the offering. Um, you know, it, it's always mentioned that um, we give thanks for the offering, not only financial, but of people's time, of people's knowledge, of resources, of food, and, and things like that. And it makes sense, you know, those, all of those things that we do, um, is, is giving, and, um, and, and I believe we do it in, as part of the work of the Lord. I've heard that over the years many times, doing the work of the Lord, but never really saw it as an offering. Um, but it does, I offer my time uh, through the volunteering that I do, and it's a very rewarding experience. Um, just last week, I, I uh, went to a training session, and uh, uh, we had a big lunch, there was a lot left over, I said I'd take it down to Hindmar Square to give to the homeless. And the smiles on the faces that I saw that day was, was amazing. Um, I knew most of them down there. Uh, one of them even said, I saw you on the news last night at the Red Shield Appeal launch, and he said, I'm proud of you. So just to hear those sort of words after you give so much of your time, your, your, your knowledge is... and, and we don't do it for that. I mean, we don't do it for the glory. We don't do it to, to um, for the recognition. But to hear that sometimes um, does make a big difference. I know over the years, uh, a lot of people in this church, uh, and a lot of people that I know through the organisations that we volunteer at, um, give a lot, give a lot of time, and a lot of it does go unrecognised, and um, just happens to be National Volunteer Week this week. So uh, if, if you see someone doing some volunteering and, and uh, getting out there and doing their bit, um, to say thank you. Um, a, a lot of the time, that's all, all, all we need. Thanks, Ellen. So uh, I'm talking about our walking together with first and second peoples, walking together. Uh, this one has grown out of the earlier covenant, covenanting committee that focused on working with Indigenous people of the Uniting Church and beyond for justice and reconciliation based on building relationships of mutuality. There is a long history in this community of supporting Indigenous groups especially the Uniting Aboriginal and Islander Christian Congress. Members of the group now have often been involved in the past with Indigenous people through education or social justice actions and in other ways. We are part of this community and other members are part of the other two communities. We have given financial and other support to ministers and members of the Congress and to the emerging leaders so they can attend leadership experiences, including being in a group that John took to Taze. The past three years, we've committed ourselves to a full and strategic priority of the congregation, ensuring that we support the implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart and especially the Voice to Parliament. 
We've worked with some groups of immigrants to share information about the referendum later this year, produced two booklets summarising the role of the voice to parliament and a dictionary defining terms, thanks to Meredith. Meredith has located lots of video resources that are useful if you have unanswered questions about the voice and our own resources from our last symposium with the Reverend Dr Chris Budden and Denise Champion are available on our website. We also have a statement from that symposium that is now approved by Church Council and been supplied to Presbytery and Synod and copies of that are available. It's important to note that the National Assembly of the Uniting Church has endorsed the Uluru Statement from the Heart, called for its full implementation along with members of other, other denominations and other faiths, supports the Yes Vote and has called on congrega congregations to do so. Also has approved a banner, uh, a sign with yes on it uh, that uh, congregations have been asked to display and thanks to the church council for making the purchase of it through the synod and for Di and Peter yesterday or the day before both of them probably struggling to put it up out the front of the church so you should go and have a look at it. We are a small subcommittee of the Mission Development Committee and we uh, now and we know that many other members of this community give us our full, their full support for the events we organise to share new insights and truth-telling by Indigenous people. We welcome others who might wish to join us or be kept informed through our newsletter or in um, a, an email network. Just let Meredith know. She's the one who actions everything. Come up soon. Coming up soon is Reconciliation Sunday and then there's NAIDOC week in July. So lots for you to help us to, with. We're also holding sessions for each worshipping community to share information and answer your questions about the voice. In taking on these roles, we believe we are guided by the spirit who challenges us to be the le the uh, risk takers acting for justice and therefore being political and that's in response to our calling to be part of the renewal of the whole creation. Happy Mature Girls' Days. I hope we girls get spoiled today. <laughs> um, there was a, a slogan many years ago um, that I think made to bumper status on cars and it was practice random acts of kindness and senseless acts of beauty. And I think that's what our faith allows us to do. It allows us to share that tremendous joy that we have in the safety of walking with God. Um, how do we do that? Well, we have a cross, and to me that's always been, the vertical axis has always been God and myself, and the horizontal one's always been God and community. So Pilgrim does many, many things, but one of the things that I love about Pilgrim are the Saturday night dinners. Um, we have a roster, there's different people on every, sorry, Sunday night dinners. Sorry about that. Um, we have a roster. We get different people on every Sunday. But it doesn't matter who comes along. There's a tremendous sense of joy and connection and love among the people that serve and among those who are also being served. Lately, we've had up to 80 people. Um, when you try and look for accommodation out there, it's hard to find and many people are really, really struggling. But what comes out of these dinners is not just the sense of being able to help people, it's a sense of connection between all of us and the strengthening of the relationships that we have with each other. And I think that's what faith is about. It's about our connections, as being talked about this morning, about building those relationships. 
So we have a marvellous time on Sunday nights. We have Bella with her pile of eggs. We have Meredith with her amazing soup. We have Alan down the end on the coffee and the tea. And a moving group of people that come in that just leave there with a tremendous sense of love and connection with each other and with those people that come in. There's another thing that I do on a Saturday morning which begins in exactly the opposite way. Uh, with two other people, I run a, something called an emotional sobriety group, which is for people who have been struggling with drug addiction and alcohol addiction. And the most astounding thing about that is the tremendous lack of connection. Addiction is exactly the opposite of what faith embodies in people. People who suffer from addiction have a tremendous emptiness within and a tape that runs, as John spoke about this morning, I didn't get enough love and I've been abandoned. It's what we call the hole in the donut, which demands to be filled by anything on which they can depend, whether that's drugs, alcohol or anything else. And the only thing that can break that circuit of addiction, which is so strong, is a belief in something much greater and the safety of that. It takes a lot of work. Some of these people have been really, really traumatised by life. And for them even to come into there is a tremendous act of courage. As part of this community and as a person who believes deeply in their own faith, I feel privileged to work both at the Sunday night dinners and that Saturday morning because I think the process of healing is also facing that part of our shadow self and knowing that we can walk through it in the belief in our own faith and safety. Twenty-five years ago, I was working at the Bowdoin Mission. And about 25 years ago, issues of refugees became front and centre and dividing our communities. There were political reasons for that. And uh, I became part of a response from a number of agencies who, because we were funded by the federal government, could not criticise the federal government so we set up a lobby group and it ran for five years and that was very exciting and interesting and when I first stopped working full time I gave it a large proportion of my time. But after three, four years, the membership, which were ordinary people, said we've given this three or four years, we've given it our best shot, nothing's changed, it's time for us to move on. I found myself almost the last member, and one person doesn't make a lobby group. This was, for a time, this was very disappointing. But through that period, I had also worked with a number of people, particularly over family reunions, and I'd walked people through the process with lawyers, and there were people I knew, and I came to see that the government could stop me acting as a lobbyist, but there was no way the government could stop me caring about refugee people that I knew. And so my wife and I have kept that up and we have wonderful friendships and we learn an enormous amount from the people we meet with. They teach us far more than we can teach them. But it's just helpful occasionally to have an older person that, that, that a person in that position can trust to ask a question about what are my options? What might I do? As I say, we have learnt far more than we have given. And I think for me personally, 
we've been supported by two groups. The first, of course, is my family, without whom I wouldn't be allowed to do it. But the second has been the involvement all the way through of people in this community. And I sometimes think that this community is full of amazing people doing amazing things, often not publicly talking about it. And I am overwhelmed at the amount of support I get and I try and give others because I'm quite sure without the support of this congregation, I wouldn't be able to tell a positive story this morning. Jesus said, I will send you an advocate. I will not leave you orphaned. You are not abandoned. What an amazing set of stories about connections and ways in which the Spirit is alive here in this place, in this community, in these people. Of course, the Spirit is involved and alive in all of our lives. And today in our offering, a bit like uh, Alan pointed out, we're going to invite you to consider what are the ways in which I'm engaged in the life of the Spirit in the world? Where is it that God is calling me to do good works, to enter into relationship, to share love with people who think there is no love in the world for them, and yet we know that there is. We know that we are all loved. Where might God be calling me? Where might God be calling you? Let us take this time to dwell in the spirit of love. Spirit of God, we give thanks. We give thanks for your presence in our lives and in this world and for the joy of joining in your work. In Christ's name we pray.
Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, at times we cannot help but feel abandoned or left to our own devices in a world of troubling difficulty. It is easy to lose track of the good, of things worth fighting for, when everything seems overwhelming or when our best efforts seem to have underwhelming results. Hold us to account in love and refresh our hope in ourselves and one another that together we can help each other to remember that we are not alone and that we are loved. If we forget that there is shape and substance to our lives, because of your love, or if we forget that in you we live and move and have our being, forgive us, loving God, and reveal yourself to us anew. Amen. And let us stand together for our final song, a song which again reminds us to not just say words, but to let our faith be who we are and how we live. So let us stand together and sing.
May we go forth into this world, into God's love, knowing that the Spirit goes with us, our advocate and guide, now and always. Thanks be to God. And the peace of our God be with you. Let us share signs of peace and reconciliation with one another.